from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. The global story that is agriculture. I'm Charles Denny, faculty and students here at the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture travel thousands of miles to share and learn. You'll hear about their amazing trip to Cambodia next on Ag Day. As spring comes early in the south. Corn acres are either going to, most of them are probably going into either cotton or beans for the most part. But is as much getting planted while we celebrate the arrival of spring with snow, how that could mean planting delays to key growing areas right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the name on the cap matches the power of one's purpose. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Spring has officially arrived and in little more than a week, the unofficial start to spring planting begins for many farmers. But in some places, planting is already well underway. In the deep south, in Texas, already this season, more than one third or 34% of the intended corn acreage has been planted along with 27% of the sorghum. And the latest report from Arizona indicates that 2% of the cotton planting is now complete. However, moisture is an issue further north. Take a look at this map. It shows total snowfall accumulation since September. Areas in blue, Minnesota in particular, have seen less than a foot of snow so far this winter, but that could soon be changing. As we look ahead to the Midwest and the Northern Plains, we are expecting some changes over the next several days that could lead to some planting delays. We are expecting a snowstorm to arrive across the Northern Plains and Upper Midwest Thursday, and a second storm arriving during the weekend into early next week. Some areas that have been experiencing snow drought, such as Minnesota, Northern Iowa, and parts of the Dakotas could see as much snow, if not more, than they have seen all winter long. Now, Rippey says the stormy weather in the northern areas could continue into late March and early April. Now, he says the moisture will be great news, but it could be a setback for farmers hoping to start field work. While corn may be going in the ground sooner in the deep south, not as much of it is getting planted in Louisiana. This week in Louisiana Agriculture's Neil Melanson explains why from Beauregard Parish. David Smith is measuring out a thousandth of an acre in his field. He's got 500 acres of corn this year. Smith considers himself lucky because he's got a market for all of it. I do have a market right here in town. I can go five minutes away and sell every bushel we have. It's a good deal for us, a good deal for the feed mill. And that's uh, really corn and milo is all going to local. And that's one reason we do plant. These sprouts of corn are less than 24 hours old. This year, the LSU Ag Center predicts 20% less of them in Louisiana. The price is down from corn compared to last year. The inputs are slightly less, not what it should be for what the corn prices are. Um, but looking for the forward this year, the former is a perpetual optimist. You know, last year we were really hammered with the droughts over here. It's a problem that's going to be across the region this year. David seed dealer Wayne Delaney says the drought last year combined with lower commodity prices points to a huge shift in acreage this year. Corn acres are either going to, most of them are probably going into either cotton or beans for the most part. Um, especially you get north of here, you know, bean yields have been extremely well. You know, guys are just accustomed cutting 80 bushel soybeans and but now even with the price of soybeans where they are there it's it's just barely getting by david is spreading out some of his risk this year with soybeans milo and wheat acres as well he says unlike last year the weather has been kind to his wheat so far we still have a ways to go we have put more uh inputs we're kind of fine-tuning what we're going to do to the wheat crop this year and not treat it as a secondhand crop as it can be treated in our area. I'm looking forward to a pretty decent wheat crop, you know, if everything goes as planned. As you can see from the field behind me, this spring is off to a strong start with mild weather as well as a good looking wheat crop and a corn planting that's going along just fine right now. However, after last year's heat and drought, many farmers like David Smith are concerned about a repeat from last year. They're hoping for better times ahead. 
More now on that late season snowfall pushing into the northern plains. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht is tracking it for us. That's a system we've been watching the last couple of days. Not all that strong, but there's going to be enough moisture, enough lift in the atmosphere uh, for not only snow to back up into the Dakotas, uh, but a good amount of rainfall, a soaking downpour uh, for parts of you know, Tennessee or Texas into Tennessee over the next 24 to 48 hours as this works uh, from the southwest up to the northeast. So you can see how these two pieces uh, kind of come together. This is Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, some snow uh, in and across portions uh, of the Midwest and also uh, the plains with the rain down here to the south. Now all of this is going to be exiting up to the north and to the northeast with another system uh, on its heels. There's Saturday at 9 p.m. A low pressure system works up to the northeast and that's going to bring in that snow and the rain all along the east coast of Friday. Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon and Saturday night with another decent trough digging back out here to the west. But before we get there, uh, these uh, temperatures are going to be rising out ahead this first system. There's a look at that forecast. We'll discuss more in detail in just a bit. And spring has sprung in upstate New York. Not. <laughs> 90s joke, not capturing a burst of lake effect snow at the SUNY Oswego campus uh, northwest of Syracuse on Tuesday morning. A good old Lake Ontario helping to bring in the moisture there. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. USDA in its first farm income outlook for the year projected a 24% decline in net cash farm income. But Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack believes we could see an uptick in income over the course of the year. Now Vilsack speaking this week at a food policy summit saying that oftentimes the first projection is quite pessimistic. And he says even if an improved forecast doesn't happen, farmers are in better shape right now to handle a cut in income. Three years of, of historic growth in farm income, which has created uh, strong liquidity uh, in farm country, uh, both in the ability to both meet short-term and long-term responsibilities and financial requirements. Now, right now, many analysts don't expect a surge of bankruptcies or foreclosures this year. Happening later today, the House Ag Committee plans to hear about issues such as intellectual property theft, cyber infrastructure hacking, and foreign ownership of American farmland. The hearing is titled, The Danger China Poses to American Agriculture. It's reported it will explore legislative options to counter these threats and bolster food and national security. Now, several officials will testify, including Republican South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, who has implemented strict measures against foreign ownership of farmland in her state. A report released by the Government Accountability Office in January revealed significant growth in foreign investment in U.S. ag land, reaching approximately 40 million acres in 2021. Now, Canada remains the largest foreign investor of U.S. land, accounting for 32% of the total foreign held land. China accounts for less than 1%. It was a better day Tuesday for grains, so what will farmers plant this spring? We'll discuss it coming up next. And later, learning about the agricultural industry of Cambodia. We'll tag along with a team from Tennessee as they get a tour today in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Steel Closing Wheels provides a 13 bushel advantage per acre in no-till and a 7 bushel advantage per acre in conventional. Do you have enough room in your bin to switch to the Germinator? Georgia may be known as the largest producer of peanuts, but one state has seen big growth in the crop, Arkansas. Now, experts say it may be approaching peak peanut. The University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture says last year, peanut growers set a state record for average yield with 5,800 pounds per acre, and that was across more than 35,000 acres. One plant pathologist in the state said that farmers could easily exceed 40,000 acres of peanuts this year, which would set the stage for record production. Now, he says that's about as much sandy soil as they have in Arkansas that isn't already planting cotton. An extension weed specialist said that Palmer amaranth, commonly known as pigweed, was the most pressing weed problem for peanut growers there in the state. We are heading into the important USDA prospective planting report at the end of the month, and average trade guesses are being released. Ag Day's Michelle Rook looks at what farmers may plant in the northern plains this spring in Markets Now. Joining us with Markets, Randy Martinson with Martinson Ag. Randy, let's talk a little bit about acreage mix up here in the northern plains and what you're anticipating for shifts. 
you know, right now, I guess, I, you know, I would expect, it depends on which region of the northern plains that you're in, but, you know, I'm expecting that we're going to see more canola up in the northern regions. We're going to see less wheat in the southern regions. Edible beans are going to increase in most areas just because of the contracts that are out there. But then again, you know, we've got barley acres that are going to decrease. We've got uh, sunflower acres that will likely see a little bit of a decrease because of the poor prices. But I think corn, you know, you get south of, you know, the southern half of North Dakota, uh, in the South Dakota, those acres will increase. Northern acre will lose a little bit of corn acres. Weather is going to have a big, um, it's going to play a big role, isn't it? Huge impact, you know, and that's the trouble is, you know, it looks like we're going to have an early spring. Guys are going to be able to be getting in the fields in April. And if you start planting one crop and it's going good, you have a tendency to keep planting that crop. And that leads to possibly seeing more, you know, wheat and more uh, corn acres, you know, Maybe Durham will get in the place of some of the spring wheat, but, uh, you know, it, yeah, if we have a good early spring. It's likely we will see more of those early crops. Price is another consideration. What looks most profitable right now? Well, right now, most profitable does look like it's going to be soybeans. You know, everybody's still going to take that risk on corn, though, just because we can always get that extra 10% uh, yield. So that's going to be one. And then I think dryable beans are going to be another one that's going to be fairly profitable because of the contracts. So where we talk about the shift into nationally, more soybean acres, maybe less corn and wheat, will that be true up here, do you think? I, I don't think so. I think we'll actually see a few, you know, corn acres I think will decrease as far as the Northern Plains is concerned overall. I think you're going to have regions that see bigger acres like the Southern region. But the north is going to lose. I think northern Minnesota will lose acres. But when you look at it in the big picture, I think, yeah, nationally, I think we'll see more soybeans. We will see more soybeans in the region, too, because of our crushed plants coming online. All right. Thanks for joining us, as always. Randy Martinson with Martinson Ag. And we'll have more Ag Day coming up. As we talked about, uh, there's going to be some snow uh, coming in and across the plains back into the Midwest the next couple of days. In terms of the snow depth, nothing out there right now, but that could change uh, to about two to three uh, inches of snowfall, uh, depending on not only uh, what's going on at the surface in terms of a warm air, but also how much snow eventually comes down. Now, this is just a trace that came through. There's that lake effect snow that we're talking about uh, into New York. You see more of the, uh, the three to possibly even six, and then back up here to the northeast with that system that came through a few days ago. So there's going to be some snow potential uh, coming through the next couple of days. The jet stream on Wednesday has a pocket of cold air working back here to the east. But by Friday, Saturday and Sunday, a shallow trough is going to dig through with a ridge of high pressure building in Monday and Tuesday. I'm going to stop this right here because you know, this is really a big signal for warming temperatures, but also another strong cold front, a ridge out here towards the east, and that will determine just how far south this cold air will be stretching. So this is on Tuesday, and I'm already starting to see some discrepancy in the overall data with this kind of setup, because it's very close. Depending on where you're located, uh, your temperature could be a difference of about nearly 20 degrees, whether you're going to be here towards the ridge or back here towards uh, the coldest of the cold air, which is uh, going to include parts of the Dakotas and stretching down here to the south. How far south? Still a little too far away to really nail down that part of the forecast, but the jet stream starting to show signs or signals of another strong cold front moving across the United States middle part of next week. Something that we've been talking about uh, the last couple of weeks as well when we're showing these temperature outlook maps. This goes through uh, April 1st and you got that blue indicating the below normal temperatures right where we're seeing that jet stream kind of line up and then where that ridge is lining up uh, above average temperatures back here into the uh, the yellow and possibly even into the orange. Quick check what we have precipitation outlook. They're looking wet in across the Midwest. This is the uh, 24th through the 28th. We'll start off in uh, Nebraska, Norfolk, uh, partly cloudy, high around 45 degrees, low of 26. What about Virginia, Norfolk, 68 degrees, sunny, low of about 42 degrees. Can you guess the last one? Ames, Iowa, mostly sunny, high of 42 degrees. Pork profits are trending higher. We have the latest numbers from the Sterling Pork Profit Tracker coming up next. And later, traveling to another country to experience agriculture there firsthand. That was the trip several Tennessee students recently took to Cambodia, what they learned in the country. Hog margins are continuing to improve for pork producers. Now, according to the latest Sterling Pork Profit Tracker, 
Farrow to finish hog producers found positive margins at an average of $9 per head for the week ending March 9th. Now that's up $5 from the previous week. Pork packers, they saw profits of about $19 per head. That's down $3 from the previous week. Now last year, pork packers saw profits of $6 per head. And while we've reported on impressive pork exports lately, including to countries such as Mexico, we've also reported on consolidation in the industry. The most recent, Tyson Foods announcing its decision to shutter its pork processing plant in Perry, Iowa. Now, it represents about 2% of the total daily kill in the U.S. Last August, Smithfield Foods announced the closure of 35 hog farm sites in Missouri. Now, hog farmers right now are coming off one of the most difficult financial years they've ever endured. According to Iowa State University's model for profitability, Farona Finnish operators in Iowa saw 2023 margins hit a record low. AgriTalk's Chip Flory discussing the latest plant closing with Farm Journal Sun Morgan. As I talk with more and more participants in the hog industry, Tyne, it feels like this is something that was kind of planned. Like you said, it's part of the consolidation of the industry that is taking place. They know, they know where these hogs that right now are going into Perry, into Tyson and Perry, they know where they're going to go after June. So it's, it, it, it's, it's not like it was a completely planned and structured play, but it's part of the industry. And, and some would say that it's growth. Other would say that it's just consolidation of the industry. In a statement, Tyson says the decision wasn't easy, but emphasized it was based on the need to focus on optimizing the efficiency in its operations to best serve its customers. Iowa State economist Lee Schulz says the negative margins in the pork industry will continue to shape hog production and capacity with more consolidation likely ahead. From ag at home to seeing farming abroad, we travel to Cambodia with a team from Tennessee to learn about agriculture and farming in that country next. Faculty and students with the University of Tennessee's Institute of Agriculture visited a nation thousands of miles away to learn and share information about farming. And as Charles Denny reports, on a trip to Cambodia, that was an educational experience for all the travelers. More than 18 hours by plane, 9,000 miles from Knoxville, Tennessee to Phnom Penh, Cambodia. That's the journey faculty and students from UT's Institute of Agriculture and its Herbert College made recently. Part of the work of the Smith Center for International Sustainable Agriculture. Here the travelers help Cambodian students plant crops. Food is food and farming is farming, um, whether you're in the southeast United States or Southeast Asia. UTIA Vice Chancellor and Vice President Keith Carver says he gained a new perspective on how agriculture is done in other countries and ways that knowledge helps us here. The Tennessee group toured agricultural high schools and universities, exchanging information about topics like pest management and growing crops in drought conditions. We're all about feeding Tennesseans. We want to provide Tennesseans access to, to healthy, safe, affordable food. And we think that's our commission to do that the world over. And, and so when you're, when you're in an area like that and you can connect with an educational partner like the Royal University of Agriculture that's in Phnom Penh um, and, and get to work with the faculty there, the administration there, it goes well beyond just your two, three week immersion in the country. A goal for the Smith Center is for someday half the students in the UT Herbert College of Agriculture to have some type of international experience before they graduate. This past year, 75 students visited 30 countries and six continents. Bella Orr and Campbell Emerson are both studying agricultural leadership, education and communication with a goal to use what they learned on this trip to further their careers. With wanting to be an ag teacher, I thought it was very interesting to see how they do it there and how it's very different from how we do it here. We don't have as many of the hands-on practices that they have because they want to learn the technique so that they can use it for their own farms at home. My biggest thing about it was uh, it was different. You know, to me, this was for agriculture education. You know, other study abroad, it's for food science, and you know, they're looking at markets. But for me, it was we're going to those schools. We're 
we're seeing how they're doing agriculture education. I think that's a big deal. Travelers of all ages agree when it comes to visiting an amazing region like Southeast Asia, you feel a bit changed by an experience like this, discovering how you might fit in the global story of agriculture. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, thanks, Charles. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Dam, Clinton Griffiths, have a great day. I'm Farm Country.